Hello and welcome to the Williamsburg Botanical Gardens 2021 Virtual Butterfly Festival. We were supposed to be live streaming, but I uh, seem to have run into a technical glitch. So we are recording this and we'll post it on Facebook. Uh, excuse me, post it on YouTube as soon as possible. So I'm going to start my share. Share screen. Go. And this is the official start. Welcome to the Williamsburg Botanical Gardens 2021 Virtual Butterfly Festival. My name is Judith Alberts and I serve on the Gardens Board of Directors. Today is the 20th anniversary of the um, tragedy of 9-11. So I'd like to have just a moment of silence before we begin our program. Thank you. Again, welcome to the Williamsburg Botanical Gardens 2021 Virtual Butterfly Festival. We were supposed to be live streaming, but that's not happening. So here's the recording and uh, we thank you very much for your patience. Okay, so that's the recording. That's a backup. It's a darn good thing too. All righty, so we're not gonna be able to use our live chat. Uh, and again, please forgive us. We're we're volunteers. All righty. So about the garden, I know that we may have people watching from who are far away from Williamsburg and don't know anything about the garden, but we are located inside Freedom Park. The garden is free to visit and open every day of the year from 7 a.m. until dusk. And canines who wish to bring well-behaved humans are certainly welcome, but humans must be leashed. The garden is really a small thing. It's only two acres inside a roundabout on the way to the parking lot, but we pack a lot into those two acres with 18 different types of habitat, including a wildflower meadow, woodlands, wetlands, a succulent rock garden, a fairy garden, to name just a few. The garden is intentionally more natural than what you might think or expect when you hear the words botanical garden. We are definitely not a highly manicured display of high maintenance plantings. Think of it more like a wild child garden. We strongly emphasize native plants that support pollinators and other wildlife. And we are uh, the site for Monarch Way Station number 3394. The garden's mission is to demonstrate environmentally responsible and sustainable gardening and to offer education on related topics. Everything is tended by dedicated volunteers and we do it on a slim budget. So yes, here comes a short pitch. The garden is a 501c3 nonprofit and receives no funding from any level of government. We depend on memberships and donations and you'll find a link to our virtual donations jar in the description. And it is now the season to order spring blooming bulbs Brent and Becky's Bulbs in Gloucester, Virginia, donates a very generous 25% of your order total if you select the garden at bloomingbucks.com. And if you shop on Amazon, please start at smile.amazon. And if you don't choose the garden, at least choose some nonprofit organization to benefit from your order because the Amazon Foundation donates a it's a very small percentage, but boy, it can add up. So support someone. You'll find the garden is on Facebook and of course here on YouTube and on Instagram. The raised monarchs um, and are reasonably close to the Williamsburg, Virginia area. We have a Facebook group that is to connect members to each other when we all get desperate for milkweed for our monarch caterpillars. If you'd like e-news from the garden, you can request it by going to bit.ly slash WBG news, or there's a link on our website, williamsburgbotanicalgarden.org. 
this afternoon's program. And boy, I'll tell you, it is a beautiful day here in Virginia. So I really appreciate that Karen and Steve McCurdy are here with us to talk about butterflies and their caterpillars. They are the immediate past co-presidents of the Butter Butterfly Society of Virginia and have served on its board continuously since 2009. And they have participated in the Gardens Butterfly Festivals since 2017. So thank you so much to both, both of you, Karen and Steve, and welcome back, virtually though it may be. So I'm gonna stop my share and turn it over to you. Okay. And let's see if we can get this up. And do -do. Voila. You're good to go. All right. Thanks, Judith. Thanks Thank for that you. introduction. Uh, we're delighted to be here. Um, we love the Williamsburg Botanical Garden um, and have really enjoyed immensely um, our participation in past butterfly festivals. Uh, we were delighted when Judy Jones reached out and, and asked us to be part of this year's virtual festival. So people often ask us, how did you get interested in butterflies? This is uh, a photo of me with our son, Ryan, seven at the time. He's now 37. And we have there on my finger, the very first butterfly we ever raised, a Gulf fritillary butterfly. We were living in Marietta outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And it was just by chance that, that we discovered this. At this point in our lives, we knew very little about mm -hmm. butterflies. Um, I had gone out on my back or upper back deck and saw these little brown things hanging under the railing, had no idea what they were. We researched, found out that they were uh, Gulf fritillary chrysalises, and we'll describe all these terms in more detail a little later. Um, and then we realized that to have those, we had to have caterpillars somewhere. Um, and we found out that the only host plant, the only plant that caterpillars would eat, and we'll talk about that more later as well, is a uh, passion vine, the Passiflora species. So I started looking for it and had to go all the way down to the ground below the lower deck to find it, which means those caterpillars probably went 30, yeah, 40 yeah, feet yeah. Uh, to come up and make their chrysalises. So we brought some caterpillars in once we, we found them there. And this was a result. We raised a few and this was our very first butterfly. So Ryan and I went out in the yard and uh, released it. It soared high into the sky. I mean, way up into the heavens, did a huge circle around our house, came back and landed, believe it or not, right on my hand and looked at me as if to say, are you my mother? And needless to say, we were hooked. So fast forward 30 years and we are still raising butterflies and moths, um, dozens of species that we have done over the years. Um, it's still our hobby, our passion, some might say an obsession. Um, and I will point out that uh, on me there, and that wasn't uh, by design, I happen to have on a, t-shirt that the top caterpillar there is actually the eastern tiger swallowtail uh, turned from green to brown, meaning it was ready to pupate. And those are eastern tiger swallowtails giving me kisses there. And of course, uh, Steve has a monarch on uh, his finger. Um, so shortly after moving to Virginia Beach from Charlotte, North Carolina in 2003, we found out that there were other people like us and uh, an organization for them. So we joined the Butterfly Society of Virginia, and we are now in our 13th year uh, serving on the board. We welcome you or invite you to um, check out our website, um, butterflysocietyofva.org. Um, we have a very active Facebook page. There's a lot of information on both. 
In 2016, we also learned of a group that was that is for people uh, who basically love all things nature, and we became certified Virginia Master Naturalists in the local Tidewater chapter. We volunteer extensively through both organizations. Um, we love doing educational outreach. Um, as Judith said, we've done the caterpillar displays at the past festivals. Uh, we do a lot of displays, um, presentations like this, and have also served many, many years as docents in the butterfly house at Norfolk Botanical Garden. Uh, it is open through the end of September and uh, the Virginia Living Museum also has a butterfly exhibit this year. And I believe theirs is open through October 1st uh, it's called Butterfly Haven. We'd also like to um, point out this time that the Butterfly Society um, Butterfly Festival in conjunction with Norfolk Botanical Garden is mostly uh, going to be mostly virtual this year. It will be from September 20th to the 24th. Um, there will be talks uh, four nights um, at six o'clock. We'll be repeating this talk. There'll also be talks on gardening, moths, uh, monarchs. There'll be a virtual monarch tagging. Uh, and then on Thursday night, I believe, there is going to be an in-person moth night. But we just would ask you to just please go to the Norfolk Botanical Garden website to check all of that out. Pre-registration is required, and there may be limited attendance on um, some of those events. Okay, so we're going to jump right in, and we have a lot we'd like to share with you. And so we're going to talk fast and, and run through it here. Uh, this is a sketch of the complete metamorphosis, which is something that butterflies and moths go through. Uh, together, butterflies, moths, and their uh, in-between group skippers are, are known as Lepidoptera. And so the life cycle is, is similar for all of them. Obviously, our talk today is going to be focused on butterflies, uh, but we'll, we'll start up here with the egg. And the, just to give you a sense of the size of eggs, almost all butterfly eggs are smaller than the head of a pin. Uh, many moth eggs are smaller than the head of a pin, uh, except for some of the very largest moths. Um, those eggs typically after being laid will hatch in, oh, anywhere from a few days to a couple of weeks. Uh, and when they hatch, out comes a little caterpillar, which then begins eating to become a large caterpillar. And so this is the larva stage of metamorphosis. The larva stage is their job is to eat. And they have, uh, we'll see in a minute, they have mandibles designed to eat leaf matter. Um, their job is to convert the carbohydrates that the leaves generate from sunlight and turn them into protein in their bodies. And that's gonna be important in a little bit, uh, we'll see. So they eat so much and grow so much that during their life, they uh, shed their skin and life as a caterpillar, they shed their skin five times. And uh, that's so they can expand and, and we'll see how that works. After they have finished eating, uh, they, they're, they're, they will have their last final uh, stuff and then they'll walk around for a bit and they will purge, uh, which means they will kind of clear all of the uh, vegetable matter out of their gut because they can't take it into their next stage. So then what they do is they find a place to position themselves and we'll talk about how the butterflies do that, uh, especially the swallowtails, which is very interesting. And as you watch what's happening, the, the caterpillar is very, very still. And in many uh, ways, he's attached uh, himself. And his body begins to go through changes inside his skin. And within about a day, suddenly, something happens and we're going to see that in just a minute and then we end up with a, um, a what's called a pupa which is the third stage pupa is where that magic happens where the it starts as a butterfly and then something else happens and after the pupa has 
uh, matured. Uh, something, uh, the butterfly, he closes out of it, that's uh, emerging. Um, and he, he finds his way out, and then we have the adult butterfly flying around. The, the purpose of the adults is to basically mate and produce new eggs to start the cycle. Now, there are two um, important facets here. The larva, again, caterpillars, they eat plants, and the each species of butterfly, particularly, is adapted the caterpillars can only eat one kind of plant, and it's sometimes a, a small uh, uh, genus of plants. Uh, sometimes it's just a, a couple of species within a genus, but they are limited. And what's happened is over the ages, the, cat, the plants don't want to be eaten, and they try to uh, pr uh, produce chemicals to keep the caterpillars from doing it. The caterpillars learn how to take them in and make those a part of them, and so they become adapted to a single plant. They cannot eat anything outside. The adults, on the other hand, um, drink uh, basically sugar water. It's nectar out of flowers. Flowers produce uh, the nectar to attract any kind of a pollinator. Uh, butterflies being one of those, they come and drink. And they can drink nectar from any plant that they can basically get their proboscis into. And you might point out you have a Luna moth picture there. There yes. are some of the large silk moths actually have no working mouth parts and don't even nectar at that stage. But today's focus is on um, butterflies. Right. Okay. Now we're going to look at the, uh, uh, the the working end of a butterfly. This is the dark form of a tiger swallowtail, and you'll you'll see a little more about this later. We can tell it is because you can see a little semblance of the yellow hiding inside the black here. But first thing, most obvious you can notice are the antenna. So what are the antenna doing? Well, they, they, they have several functions, but their main function is to smell. So if you just picture these as noses up on top of the antenna, that's how a butterfly smells. So they can smell flowers. Uh, some butterflies actually uh, e emit a sense, and so they can locate each other. Uh, right here is a large eye, and it is a compound eye. It has many lenses. And so the butterfly sees multiple images out of each eye, and they can detect minute movement because of all the lenses. And so it helps them evade things that might be chasing after them. Uh, the most distinctive thing here is this proboscis. And it is a, a, a tube uh, that functions somewhat like a straw. Down at the bottom end where it puts it into flowers, it, it, it kind of soaks up uh, the, the sugar water, the nectar, and the nutrients out of the flower and sucks it up the tube. They have no mouth. It goes straight into their body. Um, and then they have, they are insects, so they have six legs. Uh, and the legs have a special function. Since they have no mouth and can't taste, uh, they have taste buds on their feet and so, uh, or taste sensors. And that becomes important when they are looking for those special plants, which are called host plants, that the caterpillars have to eat. Uh, last thing we wanna look at here is all this uh, beige color stuff on him is pollen. So butterflies are accidental pollinators. They're going from flower to flower, dipping a, a little bit of nectar, which is what the flowers want. And the flower in, in, in encodes some of that uh, uh, pollen on top of the butterfly and he flies to the next uh, flower and deposits that. Okay, here is a butterfly nectaring. This is actually a giant swallowtail. And you see he is very efficient and he takes his proboscis and just keeps stuffing it into a little floret of that penta until he's got some uh, nectar. And we'll go on to the next, whoop, next picture. And get this one going. These butterflies are puddling, and puddling is typically done by male butterflies. The one on the left is a palamedes, and this is a spice bush. And you see they have their proboscis down, 
and it is going into the wet sand here. And what they're doing is when the sand becomes wet, minerals become dissolved and they're able to suck those minerals up and they use that to encase or include it with their sperm when they deliver that to the female and it helps her eggs develop better. Okay, here's a sketch of a caterpillar. Uh, the head is here and you can see mandibles, uh, jaws, that's so it can eat all that leafy matter that it, ha it has to consume. Now, they're not gonna be able to run away from anything. They don't need eyes to see very well. So they just have some very, very simple eyes here. Okay, again, they are insects, so they have six legs. But you think, holy cow, this guy is long. And if he's got six legs right here, he might fall off the leaf or the limb he's, he's on. So caterpillars during the caterpillar phase only have what are called prolegs. They have the abdominal prolegs and the anal prolegs. And as we see here, that helps them clamp onto a twig. So you see the mandibles right here, the insect six legs right here, and then these prolegs here. Now, these oval holes right here are how a caterpillar breathes. Those are spiracles, and oxygen goes into those holes, into the cavity of the, the, the caterpillar, gets swapped out for CO2, which gets expelled out. And it's information. That's one of our favorite um, moth caterpillars. Oh, absolutely. That's the Luna uh, that, That's caterpillar. the Luna moth mm -hmm. caterpillar. Uh, and, and just because he has such big features is why we used him as an example here. This is a uh, tiger swallowtail caterpillar. And you can see these are his eyes right here. Don't be fooled by this false eye. He wants just to scare away predators with that. Okay, let's see if we can get this one going. Okay, this, these are uh, monarch caterpillars. This one's already eaten and he's resting, getting ready to eat again. And, you can, and this is regular time, this is not sped up. And these guys are just eating machines. Okay, so let's talk about numbers of caterpillars. A, a female butterfly is going to have at least 300 eggs and is gonna to try to lay every single one of them. And if we assume that half of those eggs she lays are females, her first generation is gonna produce 150 females. If there is four generations in a summer, which are in, in monarchs, then the second uh, generation is going to have 150 times 150, that's 22,500 females, 3 million females in the third, that's a billion female or, or a, a male and female caterpillars that potentially are generated by the first female up here. That would be a lot of caterpillars to feed, but you never get that many. And here's one of the main culprits of that is a little bluebird because, oh, they love caterpillars. And so uh, Doug Tallamy, who is well known for his books, Bringing Nature Home, uh, and he talks about it. One of the big things he has done is put a camera on chickadee nests, and then he counts, or actually he has grad students that counts, the number of insects that are taken to feed a clutch of four hatchlings, and it's over 5,000. Um, most of those turn out to be caterpillars. And so you say, well, why don't they go and get bird seed and feed it? Well, Remember, we talked about the caterpillars convert carbohydrates into protein. Baby birds have to have protein in order to grow. So it's just natural for the birds to want to get caterpillars to feed their young. So instead of being 150 that survive out of that first dose of females, only three survive. That's 2% of the original 150. And if we bring our numbers down, and compare them, that means instead of ending up with a billion uh, resulting adult butterflies, we may end up with 163. Uh, Doug also has a new book that came out in late 2019 called Nature's Best Hope. And in this, he put a call to action, Homegrown National Park. And it's an idea we all need to put habitat in our backyards. Um, kind of at the same time, the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries 
uh, which is now the Department of Wildlife Resources, put out a call to action, restore the wild, let's plant habitat. And this is what they're talking about. Three houses in a row here. This house has a nice swimming pool, a great backyard for running around and playing, virtually no flowers, no trees, and nothing for caterpillars to eat. This yard over here has, has a tree, but there's no flowers or anything in this yard. So these are kind of uh, deserts out there in, in suburbia. Over here is a, a yard that has a lot of flowers. Uh, all these little white things actually turned out to be bags of, um, of mulch that had been distributed through the yard to be put out about the same time the satellite flew over to take the picture. So, um, but the important point is they have all these trees and all these trees are critical trees which are help produce caterpillars. Now, uh, here we have a bunch of flowers. Remember flowers produce nectar to entice uh, uh, pollinators to come. Butterflies take advantage of it. When you get a bunch of butterflies, it's called a rabble, or it could be called a kaleidoscope. And that was Miss Huff Lantana, I think. That was, That's an excellent, excellent. That was Miss Huff Lantana there up in, uh, in this part of Virginia. It, it, it overwinters. We've had our Miss Huffs for uh, 18, 17 years now. And, um, so, um, um, but this is a newer part of our garden and this is in the spring. So we have in the back here, we have the red, which is Monarda, uh, which is a great nectar plant. And it it's, uh, also likes to, to volunteer. So I gave it plenty of room to roam. We ha also have some common milkweed in here. You can see it a couple of blooms on them. And that, part of the milkweed serves to nectar for uh, butterflies and then the milkweed is a host plant for um, uh, monarchs which you probably heard if you saw the earlier presentation today. Uh, there's a little flea bane in here, there's a little yarrow down here and then planted in here is, is a bunch of zinnias which will be coming up soon. Uh, now you can see the zinnias in here the monarda is, is kind of finished flowering in the back. Uh, and also I got some cosmos and I found some cosmos seeds that I'd been given somewhere and I, I started them this spring. And good gracious, they're six feet tall and just absolutely beautiful. And they've got pipevine growing in the trees there at the back and that's gonna be something and, we'll talk about. And we're gonna talk about this pipevine. So that's a vine that grows and I've got it trained in this tree. So and just hoping it keeps going. This is also Cosmos. This is some I bought uh, earlier in the year, ready to plant. It didn't get near as tall, but it certainly did its job attracting, in this case, a red spotted purple. So here's uh, Steve and me, you know, working, playing. It's, you know, sometimes hard to, to tell the difference. Uh, so let's go into the garden and take a look at some of the most common uh, butterflies in Tidewater, Virginia, and how you can attract them to your yard. This is the Eastern Black Swallowtail. We're going to talk about all the swallowtails first. Uh, this one is uh, nectaring on scabiosa or pincushion flower, and this is a female. Then we have a male, Eastern Black, nectaring here on yarrow. Uh, again, male on the left, female on the right with that, some call it a blue skirt. Uh, and here they're nectaring on uh, another wonderful nectar plant, Homestead Purple Verbena. And also there's a little phlox in the photo and that's a wonderful early uh, season uh, nectar plant. And the Eastern black species is dimorphic, which means that you can tell the sexes apart because of the color differences. And in other species, uh, the males and females look almost identical. And this is how it all begins. As Steve said, the female is going to have three to 500 uh, eggs. She is actually, uh, she has, is born with all those eggs and uh, but does need them to be fertilized through mating. Uh, once that is done, she uh, is goes about trying to find the host plants that she knows her caterpillars must have. Um, in the case of the Eastern Black Swallowtails, that's anything in the carrot family, 
Uh, this is fennel. Uh, that family also includes, of course, carrot tops, uh, dill, parsley, Queen Anne's lace, and there's a wonderful native plant called zizia uh, that is also in that family. Uh, so she has actually landed on the fennel. She will have scratched it and tasted it with her feet to be sure it's the right plant. And now she is to, will curve her abdomen and deposit an egg. Here are two mature eggs. You can see the, the ripening embryos inside. And then a bunch of early instar Eastern Blacks. Um, at this stage, they have their just uh, black with that little white saddle. And uh, I think this kind of looks like a little Christmas tree of fennel there. Now all swallowtail caterpillars have this interesting uh, defensive organ called an osmotarium. That's the orange thing that's coming out of uh, this caterpillar's prothoracic segment there. Um, when they are feeling threatened or startled, um, they can evert that. They can throw that osmotarium out. And if that doesn't scare the predator off, it also produces a really stinky smell. And so hopefully that will do the trick. Okay, we're gonna talk about the pupation uh, stage now. This is actually a spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. Uh, prior to this, he was green. And when he, he had finished eating, he turned yellow and, um, and, and he took his purge. Uh, which can be a little messy. And, uh, and, and then he has affixed his tail into a bed of silk right here. And he's doing something very unusual. You can see it's kind of fuzzy up here. That's silk that he is spread around up here. And he is literally spinning a single strand of silk and he's done it in a loop. You saw him on the left coming around, laying it across his chest and then coming back and he's fixing it. And now he's starting to come back the other way. And he goes, he will take about a half hour to an hour reinforcing that little thread each time by making it thicker and making it stronger. So this is, this is actually a, an Eastern black swallowtail. Again, the, uh, the, the hind end is put into a, a pad of silk. And here is that girdle that we just saw being formed. Now it was laying across the chest while they were making it because they have to do it in front of them. So after they finish making it, they do a little whirly dervish and slip inside and then do a truss fall hanging back. Uh, this thread is so strong that if you were to grab the, a hold of that caterpillar and just tug on it to try to pull it off, that it might get severed by that thread of the girdle. So here we can see one again, tail end down here attached. Here's the girdle, but it's not as clearly looking like a caterpillar. Something's going on. The skin is getting thin. And oh, what do we got going on here? We'll keep watching. It's getting bigger. What's happening is the skin is just peeling off. And this happens in just a couple of minutes. So that is the chrysalis and it literally formed inside of the caterpillar. So it's not that he made the, the chrysalis, he didn't spin a chrysalis, it literally formed inside of him. The girdle is still here holding him up, it will remain there until he comes out. And so now we have a chrysalis and then it hardens after it's exposed. And then this is a chrysalis that has been around for about a week, which is about how long uh, it takes for the uh, metamorphosis to occur inside the chrysalis, and you begin to see these dots. And if you remember the eastern black swallowtail butterfly in the earlier pictures, they had dots on them, so that's part of their wings showing. And here comes one that is eclosing or emerging from the chrysalis and, and clawing his way out. And we have three of them here that have come out within the last hour. This one has been out the longest. This one just came out. And if you notice, he's got a fat abdomen and his wings are all folded up. So you could scrunch all that up and stuff that inside there. So that's to understand how they come out. This guy, there's no way he's fitting back inside there. What's happened is he was hanging upside down and let his wings or his crumpled up wings hang. 
and let gravity do the thing. But also, if you see this yellow vein right here, which spreads out going through, there are multiple veins. And inside that fat abdomen, they have extra hemolymph, which is the blood of a um, of a, a butterfly. And it's like hydraulic fluid. In this case, they pump it into the wings and it forms, ca causes those wings to stretch out. And then they hang there while everything dries. And so the, the abdomen is smaller. The, the hemolymph is pumped out the wings and the butterfly will be ready to fly in about an hour or two. One last thing the butterfly has to do is to proboscis actually is in two pieces when it, it, it is first uh, emerging and closing. And so it has to curl up and uncurl the proboscis. And as it does so, it gets closer and closer together until the two end pieces are one. So let's move on now to the second um, swallowtail species we're going to highlight. It's the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. On the left there is the female, the male on the right. Again, the female of this species has that blue skirt, if you will. Now, the female can also take what's called a dark form or a melanistic form. And this is actually um, an example of Batesian mimicry, which Steve is gonna describe in, in a little bit more detail later. Uh, in this case, the they are actually uh, trying to mimic the pipevine swallowtail because it is distasteful to predators because of the pipevine that it eats. So this is a, um, a defense or you know protection. So you will most likely see, we see a lot of these in our yard because we yeah. have a lot of pipevines. So they, typically you'll see this dark form or melanistic version where you are living somewhere where there are also pipevines. Uh, here is, uh, one that is nectaring on goldenrod, which is of course a wonderful late blooming nectar plant. Here's one on buttonbush. Oh. Eastern tigers absolutely adore buttonbush as do many other uh, insects. Um, and a little gardening tip, uh, if you deadhead these flowers, you'll get a nice second bloom. The primary uh, host plant in this area for Eastern tigers is the tulip poplar. Uh, and I don't know if I mentioned that the Eastern tiger is our state insect. And that makes sense because, you know, the tulip poplar is, is, is very plentiful in Virginia. Uh, they will also lay on uh, native black cherry and swamp bay magnolia. So again, the female has landed on this leaf, scratched it with her feet with her, to taste it, uh, determined it's the right plant, and she is proceeding to lay an egg. And that happens very quickly. And here is the egg and the little hatchling is coming out. Here he comes, almost out, there he is. And then he does a little happy dance. And then he'll probably turn around and eat that egg. Uh, there's thought that there's some nutrition in it. And also maybe he kind of wants to get rid of the evidence that he was there. These are the instars of the Eastern tiger that you know Steve described, they, they eat so much, they outgrow their cuticle or skin and have to shed it and then move on to their what's you know their next uh, stage. And in the case of the Eastern tiger, and don't you love ours are so well behaved. We oh gosh. got them to line up, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but we wanted to demonstrate that in this species, each instar, the caterpillars look a little different. Uh, in other species like the monarch that uh, Joni uh, spoke of, we hope you saw her uh, talk uh, earlier today. Um, they're pretty much, the, they look the same in every instar. And here's an example of the molting. Uh, again, they're gonna lay down some silk. It, this is a very vulnerable time for them and the molting can take almost 24 hours. So they, uh, they find some place where they feel safe, they'll secure themselves with silk. And then as Steve said, they literally walk out of their old cuticle or skin and then they usually turn around and eat that. And here's an example of that osmotarium again uh, in this Eastern tiger. So the next species is the pipevine swallowtail, nectaring here on Buddleia, a couple more shots of it, beautiful, beautiful butterfly. And the uh, only host plant for this butterfly is pipevine. There are a couple of different species of pipevine. This happens to be the Aristolopia macrophylla, or called, which is also called Dutchman's pipe. And it's so named because its flowers are thought to look like the Amirsham pipe. 
Now, most butterflies lay their eggs singly, but this is one of a, a species that actually does, butterfly species that lays their eggs in a cluster. And when the caterpillars hatch, the little hatchlings actually stay together and they move from leaf to leaf together eating until they get into one of the later instars and they kind of go off on their own. And the one thing you recall Karen mentioned earlier right. about the, um, um, this butterfly, the, the Aristolochia has chemicals in it that the caterpillars uh, ingest and keep in their system that makes them very distasteful to birds. Plus they look really scary. And Although they look scary. I will Gosh, point yeah. out that there are at least in this part of the world, there are no butterfly caterpillars that uh, sting you. Some of them look like they could, and they look very scary, but there are none that uh, have any, uh, you know, are, uh, have any venom or, or uh, will sting you. There are some moth caterpillars that you do need to watch out for. Uh, and there's here again is uh, the chrysalis of the pipe vine swallowtail, and it can come in, in multiple colors. Okay, this is a zebra swallowtail, uh, appropriately named, and um, it's, it's one that is common in our area. However, a lot of people have never seen it, and they think, wow, that's, that's a special kind of butterfly. Um, and the reason that it's not seen everywhere in this part of Virginia is because its host plant is the pawpaw tree. And the pawpaw tree is an understory tree growing in woodlands, typically wet woodlands, or maybe near a creek or areas that, that tend to stay a little moist. And so mama is not going to leave and move very far away from where those trees are. So you're only likely to see this butterfly in an area that has pawpaw trees. And here it is uh, on some penta nectaring. And also that's, that shows uh, milkweed, common milkweed, where it's nectaring, great nectar plant. And here it is coming in for a landing on its looked and said, hey, I think that may be pawpaw. And in fact, it is. Here he, uh, she has uh, tasted it, it's found out is pawpaw, put her uh, abdomen down and is depositing an egg. Now you say, gosh, that looks like a small little tree. We actually saw one or two flying in our yard about the first or second season, figured out, hey, there's got to be some pawpaw around, so we need to add to that. Went out and bought a pawpaw plant, and yep, if you plant it, they will come. A couple of uh, caterpillars. Uh, this one is just finishing molting. Again, put the silk pad down, put his tail end in it, and now has finished uh, forming the new skin underneath the old one and is literally walking right out of it. Our next uh, swallowtail species that we'll talk about is the beautiful spicebush swallowtail. Another photo there and there. Here's one nectaring. And the host plants for this species are spicebush and sassafras. And here is a video from the Butterfly House at Norfolk Botanical Garden. We had a display of uh, sassafras to, to, to show the caterpillars. And here come the female um, butterflies. They have found it and are laying their eggs. And you saw that last one that was right here in the corner. It's that fast, them laying an egg. They sample, taste it, boom. Egg, egg planted. Now the caterpillars of this species um, have an interesting thing that they can do for, for protection, for defense. They actually will lay down a pad of silk on leaves of sassafras or spice bush. And as that silk dries, it actually contracts and folds around them. So they have a nice little hiding place. They are an amazing caterpillar. Um, in the later in stars, they turn green. They have these unbelievable large fake eyes um, and they so they look a little bit they're trying to look a little bit like a snake to scare off predators and they can actually even kind of rear up their head to the thorax and look even more snake-like. Here's a close-up of the actual head it's almost like they have a disguise like a hoodie they can pull over themselves with that wonderful fake eye fake eyes um, and Steve is pointing out those are the actual six simple eyes. They have six uh, simple eyes on each side of, 
of their head. And some of you may have uh, heard of Caterpie, which is um, the Pokemon character. It was actually patterned after the spice bush swallowtail because the caterpillar, because they're so awesome. Uh, again, with that big fake eye. And this one even has that osmetarium stinky gland. <laughs> Okay, now here is this on the left is a spice bush caterpillar. And this is his cousin right here and a really close cousin. Uh, a little bit, uh, very similar, but a little bit different. Doesn't have the eyebrows. And if you notice the fake eyes kind of stick out, uh, protrude from the body and look even more like a bulging eye. And this is the Palomides caterpillar. And here is a slightly younger Palamedes, and you can see that eye sticking out, and you, you can even see the light reflecting in it like it would off a, a real eyeball. Just immense detail. Also, osmeterium in, in these guys. Here's the adult, does not look like the uh, spice bush swallowtail. Uh, very, very striking butterfly. It's got these uh, yellow stripes on a black abdomen. Now, uh, I'm gonna do a little science here really quick. We're, we're looking at the um, um, tax taxonomy of, of, of the uh, two swallowtails. And if we go all the way down, we see both of them are in the genus Papilio. And, and then it's just the species difference, the Palamedes and the Troilus or the spice bush. That means that, hey, they're cousins. They might try things that, never mind. Uh, but um, we, we did take a picture in, uh, or someone took a picture in the butterfly house of uh, uh, Palamedes and a spice bush actually mating. Now, don't know what the result of this was egg-wise. And one thing about uh, mating is if the female mates a second time or a later time, the sperm from the new male will supplant this, the sperm from the first male. And so it may not, it may have been, become a moot point anyway. Now we're gonna look at the plants here. Again, look at the taxonomy. And this is the spice bush right here. And this is the uh, sassafras and the um, uh, red bay, which is the tree that is the host plant for the caterpillars of the Palamedes. And all, of, and all of them are in the family Lauraceae. So it's, it's one step up, uh, but they're all in the family. And actually the caterpillars, especially if the leaves are very, very tender, can occasionally nibble on leaves of the opposite host plant, but that's because they're very close. Now, uh, this is all important because uh, about uh, almost 20 years ago, a little beetle happened uh, to show up in the um, Savannah Harbor area, uh, came, came from the far east, and he's the red bay ambrosia beetle. And it turns out that uh, he has an affinity for red bay trees and literally wiped out every red bay from, oh, about Wilmington, North Carolina, down to uh, into Florida. Um, but in, again, the red bay is close to the, the sassafras and to the spice bush plants. And so he's also a threat to those. So if you see a sassafras tree or a red bay tree in Virginia that is showing signs of extreme distress, very, very quickly notify your local extension agent. Okay, giant swallowtail. This is our largest butterfly in the area. And um, he, his host plant for his caterpillars is things in, uh, in the family that includes rue and citrus plants. And uh, the farther south you go, the more prevalent he is, especially you get the Florida citrus plants. And as a matter of fact, his caterpillar has its own name in Florida. It's called the orange dog because he likes to eat. Okay, now I know a lot of you saw the presentation earlier about uh, the monarchs and you said, oh, you got another monarch. Nope, we're skipping the monarch, but we're looking at a mimic of the monarch, which is called the viceroy. And, and like the monarch, both of these are in a brushfoot family, but there are some really key differences. Now, Batesian or Malarian, boy, you're getting really scientific splitting the hairs on this. 
Bates in mimicry is like with the, the tiger swallowtail uh, imitating the um, um, pipevine. pipevine swallowtail and wanting to look like him and, 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 and masquerade as him. But in this case, the monarch picks up uh, cardenolides, which makes him distasteful to birds. It actually makes him throw up. And the viceroy right here uh, gets salicylic acid from the, the, uh, its host plants, which is uh, mainly willow, and makes him distasteful to birds. So both of them reinforce the notion that if, you see a if you're a bird and you see a bright orange butterfly, don't eat them. Here is the eggs. Here's one here, one here, and one right here of the viceroy that were laid on this little willow. Here is a, a blow up of that egg. It looks like the Epcot dome. This is the caterpillar. It doesn't look like anything we've seen yet, does it? Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you think what he's going to look like, you'll see in just a moment when he folds up, when he gets scared and, and folds up, he looks like a pile of bird mess. Uh, this is a black cherry, and this is a, um, a plant that the, these caterpillars can eat in addition to the willow. Uh, this is a red spotted purple. This is in the same genus as uh, the viceroy. So they're very, very close. Don't, their caterpillars are nearly identical, but the butterflies are, are much different colored. And here is the folded up caterpillar looking like, yes. Uh, now, uh, all of our swallowtails earlier spend the winter as chrysalises. The, 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 the chrysalis, their, their fluids inside are like antifreeze. They can survive cold, hard freezing temperatures. And so all their chrysalises in the fall just hang around all winter long outside and protect them until the spring comes. And then they, the butterfly will emerge from the chrysalis. In the case of, of the viceroy and the red spotted purple, their caterpillars actually, as second instars, begin to make a little home inside a leaf, putting some silk over it, and they will spend the winter as a caterpillar in the tree, waiting for the tree to leaf out when it warms up in the spring, and then it will commence eating with a head start of about a week and a half over all the other guys. And that's called a hibernaculum. That is called a hibernaculum. That's exactly right. Okay, moving on really quickly, we're going to just go through some other uh, common species. And again, as Steve has pointed out, all of the there are multiple generations, anywhere from two to four, even we sometimes get a fifth generation of monarchs um, throughout the spring and summer of all the butterfly species. All of the swallowtails, the last generation in the fall, do overwinter as chrysalises. Uh, he just showed you that the red spotted purple and viceroy uh, overwinter as caterpillars. Uh, and then we have some like the red admiral. And which and this is uh, the host plant false nettles um, and buckeyes. Their host plants um, uh, are. Gerardia. Ger oh, Gerardia. Right. And uh, I was I was going to say they were on pintas and the second one was on monarda or bee balm which are, are great nectar plants uh gerardia plantain um and those actually what we call emigrate they don't make that long migration that joni told you about this morning all mm -hmm. the way that like the monarchs do the one generation the last generation go all the way to uh, typically to mexico possibly to florida uh to overwinter uh, some of these other species emigrate, E-M-I-G-R-A-T-E, -E, just go south. They kind of go a few states south. And then we have the question mark butterfly, and uh, it is so named because of that little symbol on its uh, wing there. And there's actually a, a comma butterfly that is very, very similar, just doesn't have the little dot. Here's a question mark puddling. These actually overwinter as adults in our area in um, uh, log piles or, you know, they'll find some kind of shelter and they'll actually overwinter as adults. Um, that last one was, uh, uh, the first one was nectaring on uh, Black-Eyed Susan or Rebecca. Um, here is its caterpillar uh, on elm, which is one of the host plants. And here are a couple of its caterpillars on hops. 
Uh, and even the caterpillar will take at rest that question mark uh, shape. Okay, now we have some more butterflies here. You can see them in this beautiful field. And these are variegated fritillaries. A little close up view of it. This is the um, uh, ventral view, which is not quite as exciting. And this is on uh, a verbena, a Brazilian verbena. And this is its, oh, absolutely gorgeous. It, these copper colors are just, uh, just stunning, uh, absolutely stunning uh, chrysalis. chrysalis. And here, so this is the caterpillar here. And on its host plant, which is um, um, uh, passion flower, and uh, occasionally they will also eat violets. But this is its uh, a, a, a distant relation cousin to it. It's called the Gulf fritillary, and it also eats the passion flower. This is the passion flower flower on the vine. Yeah, actually, it's the leaves of the passiflora, the passion vine. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is the Gulf, and as a matter of fact, that's the one we have behind us. <laughs> And, uh, and, and was the first one that we yeah, ever we, released. Yeah. yeah. So here, here is an acrobatic female gulf. And this is a tendril. It's a vine, remember. And the tendril helps it hold on. And she, you can just see a little yellow egg right there. She is depositing the egg on the end of that tendril. She just likes showing off. So we're going to look quickly at uh, a few last species. This is the American snout, very aptly named, as you can see. Um, it actually is another one that overwinters as adult. Uh, primary um, host plant is hackberry. Then we have the painted lady. Uh, thistle is a host plant for it. Uh, the American lady, uh, cudweed, pussy toes are uh, its host plants. We have uh, the pearl crescent. Uh, actually, it overwinters as a third instar caterpillar. Um, host plants are asters. On the left here, the smaller one is the pearl crescent and then the silvery checker spot. Uh, now, we don't actually get those. We're in Virginia Beach. We don't get those down this part, but uh, Central Virginia West does. So um, uh, we actually took this, I think, at Natural Bridge, Natural Bridge. when we were, yes. we were visiting. And the um, silvery checker spot uses mostly sunflowers um, and black-eyed Susan as uh, the host plants. Now, this is a tiny, but a very exquisite um, little butterfly called the Eastern Tail Blue. Its host plant is clover. And as you can see, can you point that out, Steve? The, this is a female and it is actually laying an egg, a tiny egg on that uh, head of that clover. Now think, that is a little teeny clover flower that big that's that it's in the grass. So you can see how small that little, little fella is. So ventral view there and then the, uh, the dorsal view here, a very pretty little little butterfly. Uh, now we're going to look at some hair streaks. This is the gray hair streak and uh, it actually prefers, um, its caterpillars eat uh, plants in the pea or uh, mallow family. This is a banded hair streak, host or hickory, oak, and walnut. And all of the hair streaks have those appendages at the tail that look like antenna. And they're there's a reason for that. They are trying to fake out predators and make the predators think that is their head in and their antenna. Um, and we've got a little video here. They will actually move those back and forth to make it even, you know, even more of a deception that that is their head and that is their antenna. And they are hoping that if pre a predator comes along uh, like a bird, it's going to take a bite out of that end because it can, the butterfly can survive that. It would not survive if it took uh, its actual head. This is the beautiful great purple hair streak, probably the largest of the, um, still a small butterfly, but probably the largest of the hair streaks and its um, host plant is mistletoe. And that one is sitting on mountain mint. I'm not sure if I mentioned that uh, in talking about the flowers we have. That has become an essential part of our garden for small butterflies such as the hair streaks um, and uh, skippers, the and, a skippers lot of bees and, and, a, and a lot of bees and wasps. It's just incredible uh, what a pollinator magnet it is. And here's a close up mm. of that one. It's a really a beautiful, yeah. beautiful butterfly.
Uh, this is cabbage white. This is a female. You can tell that because it has the uh, two dots on the wings. Uh, the males just have one. Primary host are plants in the cruciferous family, cabbage, broccoli, kale. This is a uh, giant cloudless sulfur, uh, host or senia, uh, senna, excuse me, or cassia. Photo there. And that one going deep dive into, yeah. <laughs> into that flower. Uh, this is a long-tailed skipper, host or in the legume family. And I love this next shot that uh, Steve caught of this one coming in, uh, proboscis unfurled, ready for action. He's ready to, to get that nectar. This is a little silver spotted skipper. This is its caterpillars, which I absolutely adore. And uh, you'll find them on native wisteria. And, uh, you know, with those fake eyes, fake eye spots, it, to me, it looks a little bit like an alien. And then here's a neat fact. Oh. Um, this caterpillar can actually increase the blood pressure in their hind end. Okay. And that allows them to propel their frass, which is a fancy word for caterpillar poop, 38 body lengths. You know, and it, there's an advantage to that. You get rid of the frass, then maybe the predators won't, you know, find you. So propels it 38 body lengths. I mean, come on, how cool is that? Yeah, that you is know, we can't cool. make this. We can't make this stuff no. up. And this is its pupa. Um, the silver spotted skipper is actually sew leaves together uh, to protect themselves when they're eating, and they kind of do the same thing, make a little leaf shelter, uh, which to pupate. And I think their pupa kind of look like a uh, little baby uh, manatees. And the last butterfly that we're going to show here is tiny. I would say it's probably about the size of, you know, not even as big as a quarter. What no, would you say? Uh, Maybe more a, like a, a dime. dime. Yeah. Um, but tiny, but exquisite. This is the lace-winged uh, road roadside skipper. Uh, host plant is cane. And with that, our time has come to an end. So we need to head in from the garden uh, we'll turn it back to Judith. I know we weren't able to um, have the live chat, but I will say that if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, we are happy to, for you to send those to us at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at butterflysocietyofva.org, or you can send us a message on our Facebook page. Uh, we also have a lot of people that will send us photos when they see a butterfly, moth, caterpillar, you know, that they aren't sure what it is, we're always happy to try to ID those for you. So we welcome welcome your uh, your questions, your photos, everything there. Thank you. Karen and Steve, thank you. This has been fascinating. I um, try to find a, one or two new species each year. And, but your experience, you've been at this for 30 years and it is, <laughs> Truly amazing. I, I bow to your knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is a wonderful, wonderful hobby. And we're hoping it's keeping our brain sharp because we just, we're, we learn something new every day. I mean, yeah. I, you know, just could continually learning with this hobby. So it's, and it does also combine um, uh, other loves you had actually before we got into butterflies, uh, photography, gardening, you know, they, it kind of combines all of those really well. So plus I'm a bit of a science geek and, and the, there's so much studies going on, some good, some not so good, but uh, the, the amazing things, uh, you know, just again, always something new, always something new. It, it's, it's wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. It, 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 it becomes an obsession, a wonderful, magnificent yeah. obsession. And I can't think of anything better because watching a, a caterpillar become a chrysalis or watching a chrysalis emerge to the adult never gets old. Nope, that's You're right. right. Absolutely yeah. right. And, and, and that's why we are so uh, glad when people you know, try, uh, you know, with a, a caterpillar kit uh, to raise monarchs or black swallowtail or something is because, especially with kids, you, you just can't, you know, you can't replace that and uh, uh, that experience. Well, just, just briefly, since it's just the three of us, we can take all the time we want. Um, in festivals past, one of the, the highlights has always been uh, the craft where the families, it's usually one per family, make 
actually I have, <laughs> I didn't plan this. It's just that I've been working on this and I'm ah, gonna try yes. and hold it carefully. A little pyramid in which a we would give them everything they needed to, to make and they would actually make it and glue and paste and cut. And this is not a real chrysalis. This was just our a little piece of, um, I'm probably having trouble seeing, just a little piece of leaf so that we could take some pictures and create it. And that has always been such a highlight. Sure, and, and it's, it's, it's a great design because those butterflies have to hang as soon as they emerge from the chrysalis. And, and so it's perfect. It's just they, they hold on to their attachment and uh, um, are, are, are able to let their wings unfold and uh, pump them up and, uh, and, and be ready to fly. So yeah, that's, that, that really is nice. And this year, what we did, because it was virtual, um, mm -hmm. we actually had a sign up so that families could get a, a we called it a pyramid, no, painted lady chrysalis kit. Ah. Um, and last, yesterday afternoon from three till six, we had our drive through pickup. Um, oh. And so I'm very eager. I'm hoping that those families will share some photos and, you know, did their Perfect. butterfly, when did their butterfly come out? We're hoping we timed our order from the breeder so that the chrysalis, chrysalises would hopefully come out Monday or Tuesday mm. um, so that the families can watch the changes and experience that absolutely amazing moment of emergence and then watching a live butterfly fly away. Yeah. So, all right, here's hoping for next year uh, mm. with a real butterfly festival and I'll be yeah. posting this video um, on YouTube as, as soon as I possibly can. So, okay. all right. thank you, Judith. Thank, thank you, you Judith. for having us. And, we enjoyed it very and, much. And, and thanks for being the engineer of this thing. Uh, that's, uh, that's uh, you always have to have a good engineer and uh, to be sure the train's moving in the right direction. Or at least that the train moves one way or, or the another. train at least moves. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to leave the station now. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Okay. Our pleasure. Thank you.